So hear now this good news concerning Jesus Christ, according to St. Mark. It was two days before the Passover and the festival of unleavened bread. The chief priests and the scribes were looking for a way to arrest Jesus by stealth and kill him. For they said, not during the festival, or there may be a riot among the people. While he was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at the table, a woman came with an alabaster jar of very costly ointment of nard. And she broke open the jar and poured the ointment on his head. But some who were there said to one another in anger, Why was this ointment wasted in this way? For this ointment could have been sold for more than 300 denarii, and the money given to the poor. And they scolded her. But Jesus said, Let her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has performed a good service for me. For you always have the poor with you, and you can show kindness to them whenever you wish. But you will not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for its burial. Truly I tell you, wherever the good news is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in remembrance of her. Then Judas Iscariot, who was one of the twelve, went to the chief priest in order to betray him to them. When they heard it, they were greatly pleased and promised to give him money. So he began to look for an opportunity to betray him. On the first day of unleavened bread, when the Passover lamb is sacrificed, his disciples said to him, Where do you want us to go and make preparations for you to eat the Passover? So he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go into the city. And a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him, and wherever he enters, say to the owner of the house, The teacher said, ask, Where is my guest room where I am to eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large upper room, furnished and ready. Make preparations for us there. So the disciples set out and went to the city and found everything as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover meal. When it was evening, he came with the twelve. And when they had taken their places and were eating, Jesus said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They began to be distressed and to say to him one after another, Surely not I, he said to them, it is one of the twelve, one who is dipping bread into the bowl with me. For the Son of Man goes as it is written of him, but woe to that one by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that one not to have been born. While they were eating, he took a loaf of bread. And after blessing it, broke it, gave it to them, and said, Take, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to them, and all of them drank from it. He said to them, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly I tell you, I will never again drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. And Jesus said to them, You will all become deserters, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter said to him, Even though all become deserters, I will not. Jesus said to him, Truly I tell you, this day, this very night, before the cock crows twice, 
you will deny me three times. But he said vehemently, even though I must die with you, I will not deny you. And all of them said the same. They went to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. He took with him Peter and James and John and began to be distressed and agitated. And he said to them, I am deeply grieved even to death. Remain here and keep awake. And going a little farther, he threw himself on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. He said, Abba, Father, for you all things are possible. <clears throat> Remove this cup from me. Yet, not what I want, but what you want. He came and found them sleeping, and he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not keep awake one hour? Keep awake and pray that you may not come into the time of trial. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again he went and prayed, saying the same words. And once more he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were very heavy, and they did not know what to say to him. He came a third time and said to them, are you still sleeping and taking your rest? Enough! The hour has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up! Let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Immediately, while he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived, and with him there was a crowd with swords and clubs, from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. Now the betrayer had given them a sign, saying, The one I will kiss is the man. Arrest him and lead him away under guard. So when he came up, he went up at once to him and said, Rabbi, and kissed him. Then they laid hands on Jesus and arrested him. But one of those who stood near drew his sword and struck the slave of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Then Jesus said to him, Have you come out with swords and clubs to arrest me, as though I were a bandit? Day after day I was with you in the temple teaching, and you did not arrest me. But let the scripture be fulfilled. All of them deserted him and fled. A certain young man was following him, wearing nothing but a linen cloth. They cut, caught hold of him, but he left the linen cloth and ran off naked. They took Jesus to the high priest, and all the chief priests, the elders, and the scribes were assembled. Peter had followed him at a distance, right into the courtyard of the high priest. And he was sitting with the guards, warming himself at the fire. Now the chief priest and the whole council were looking for testimony against Jesus to put him to death. But they found none. For many gave false testimony against him, and their testimony did not agree. Some stood up and gave this testimony excuse me, against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands, and in three days I will build another not made with hands. But even on this point, their testimony did not agree. Then the high priest stood up before them and asked Jesus, Have you no answer? What is it that they testify against you? But he was silent and did not answer. Again the chief priest asked him, Are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? Jesus said, I am. And you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, Why do we still need witnesses? You have heard his blasphemy. 
What is your decision? All of them condemned him as deserving death. Some began to spit on him, to blindfold him, and to strike him, saying, Prophesy! The guards also took him over and beat him. While Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came by. When she saw Peter warming himself, she stared at him and said, You also were with Jesus, the man from Nazareth. But he denied it, saying, I do not know or understand what you are talking about. And he went out into the forecourt. Then the cock crowed. And the servant girl, on seeing him, began again to say to the bystanders, This man is one of them. But again he denied it. Then after a little while, the bystanders again said to Peter, Certainly you are one of them, for you are a Galilean. But he began to curse, and he swore an oath. I do not know this man you are talking about. At that moment, the cock crowed for the second time. Then Peter remembered that Jesus had said to him, Before the cock crows twice, you will deny me three times. And he broke down and wept. As soon as it was morning, the chief priest held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council. They bound Jesus, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate. <clears throat> Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? He answered him, You say so. Then the chief priest accused him of many things. Pilate asked him again, Have you no answer? See how many charges they bring against you? But Jesus made no further reply, so that Pilate, was amazed. Now at the festival, Pilate used to release a prisoner for them, anyone for whom they asked. Now a man called Barabbas was in prison with the rebels who had committed murder during the insurrection. So the crowd came and began to ask Pilate to do to, for them according to his custom. Then he answered them, Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? For he realized that it was out of jealousy that the chief priest had handed him over. But the chief priest stirred up the crowd to have him release Barabbas for them instead. Pilate spoke to them again, Then what do you wish me to do with the man you call the king of the Jews? They shouted back, Crucify him. Pilate asked them, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Crucify him. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released Barabbas for them, and after flogging Jesus, he handed him over to be crucified. Then the soldiers led him into the courtyard of the palace, that is, the governor's headquarters, and they called together the whole cohort, and they clothed him in purple cloak, and after twisting some thorns into a crown, they put it on him. And they began saluting him, Hail, King of the Jews! They struck his head with a reed, spat upon him, and knelt down in homage to him. After mocking him, they stripped him of the purple cloak and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him out to crucify him. They compelled a passerby who was coming in from the country to carry his cross. It was Simon of Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus. Then they brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of a skull. And they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him and divided his clothes among them casting lots to decide what each would take. It was nine o'clock in the morning when they crucified him. The inscription of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. And with him they crucified two bandits, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by derided him, shaking their heads and saying, Aha! 
You who would destroy the temple and build it in three days. Save yourself. Come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priest, along with the scribes, were also mocking him among themselves and saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. Let the Messiah, the King of Israel, come down from the cross now so that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him also taunted him. When it was noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. At three o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabetani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they said, listen, he is calling for Elijah. And someone ran, filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a stick, and gave it to him, saying, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come and take him down. Then Jesus gave a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Now when the centurion, who stood facing him, saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, Truly this man was God's son. There were also women looking on from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, and Mary the mother of James the younger, and of Joses, and Salome. They used to follow him and provided for him when he was in Galilee. And there were many other women who had come up with him to Jerusalem. When evening had come, and since it was the day of preparation, that is, the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a respected member of the council, who was also himself waiting expectantly for the kingdom of God, went boldly to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate wondered if he were already dead. And summoning the centurion, he asked him whether he had been dead for some time. When he learned from the centurion that he was dead, he granted the body to Joseph. Then Joseph bought a linen cloth, and taking down his body, wrapped it in the linen cloth, and laid it in a tomb that had been hewn out of the rock. He then rolled a stone against the door of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of Joseph saw where the body was laid. Through these words, our God is still speaking. Thanks be to God, still speaking God. <clears throat> there is enough material in this gospel reading to preach for decades. It is so full of meaning for all of us. But I don't think you want to sit here for decades, so I'm just going to pick a part. And what I'm going to do is go back to that uh, epistle reading, our first lesson, where it talks about the mind of Christ, where it talks about Jesus, who though he was God, found himself in the form of a mortal and became obedient. Obedient unto death, even death on a cross. And we are invited to have this same mind in us. Not that we are facing crucifixion, but to have it in this way. Jesus had a vision. He had a vision of who God was. He knew God. And as a human, he knew God. 
He went out in the early morning. He went out into the wilderness. He spent long hours in prayer. <clears throat> Being in the presence of God. Knowing who God is. And in knowing that, he began to understand what the reign of God would look like. In the language of the day, Caesar is head of the kingdom. He has a different title, but he's the king. Jesus has a view of what it would be like if Caesar were no longer king, but God was king. And from that vision, he had a mission. And he went out into the world teaching and preaching and healing and calling people to join into that reign of God. And when he saw where that was going to take him, that it was not going to be popular with those who were in authority, he did not run away, but he went to the seat of power and faced them. The crowds welcomed him. They greeted him as he came in. That whole entrance into Jerusalem was one huge demonstration against Caesar. He was coming in one gate as Pilate and Herod and the uh, legions were coming in the other. He came on a colt. A sign of peace and a sign of a king who is about to be crowned. He faced them because he had a vision of who God was and what God wanted to do. And he was willing to face that through no matter what. We need that kind of vision. We gather today and we celebrate that because we know what's coming next Sunday. We know that Jesus was right. That, Jesus, that God's vision that Jesus had will come about. And the miraculous sign of that is the resurrection that we will celebrate. But to get there, we have to go through this time. But we can't go through it. And our mission won't be clear unless our vision is. Unless our vision of what God is needing to have done. There are things about winter that I'm not terribly crazy about. The thing that drives me nuts the most is never being able to see out the windows of the car. Always having to clean them off. Going through gallon after gallon of windshield washer, trying to get the thing cleared off so I can see out. But it's necessary. You can't get where you're going if you can't see where you're going. Have this mind in you, which was in Christ Jesus, the vision of what God wants to do in this world. That's what we're called to have. And then we can face whatever is around us. I was working around the apartment yesterday, and I wasn't doing anything that required a lot of deep attention to it, so I turned on a golf match and was watching that and uh, enjoying that, but it ran out uh, before the time slot did. 
And as a friend of mine says, I will watch sports, I will talk about sports, but I will not watch people talking about sports. <laughs> so when the sporting event was over and they began to talk about sports, I started channel surfing and I came across the coverage of March for Our Lives and listened to those youth who have a very clear vision of what they want this country to be like. And they went to the seats of power and they made that known. And I know that they weren't just in Washington because there was a huge march in Columbus and lots of other places. They have a vision and so they know what their mission is. And they're very clear about that. That's the kind of power we have in the church when we are willing to see with God's eyes, to have the mind of Christ that looks and asks the question, not what do I want, we're all good at answering that. What does God want? What is God's vision? What does God desire for this world? Just recently, we read from John 3 about God's love for the world. And the proclamation of Jesus, I didn't come for destruction, I came for salvation. What does the salvation of God look like in our community? We sing Hosanna, and we think it is a very religious word. Hosanna literally means, save us. That's what they were shouting to Jesus. Save us. Save us from this insane Roman empire that comes in power and violence and takes away our freedom. It does not allow us to worship our God like we need to. Save us. There are people out in our community who are shouting, save us, from all kinds of things. Save us from addiction. Save us from violence. Save us from poverty. Save us from a lack of education. What is the vision? that God has for people. That's what we're called to have. During this holy week, during this last time of Lent, of reflection, well, hopefully not the last time of reflection, but the last time of special reflection of Lent, let's think about what is it that Jesus saw. What is it we need to see that will take us through the tough times and take us to Easter, to victory, to resurrection and new life for us as individuals, for us as a congregation, for us as the human race. Have this mind in you, which was in Christ Jesus. Amen.